And it makes me think of how you can have morbidly obese people, but they're extremely malnourished. I've been seeing a couple articles on that recently. How did we strip all the nutrition out of food? Yeah, uh, we did that by destroying soil micro microbiology through the wide scale use of you know uh, herbicides and pesticides. So um, our laboratory is expert in glyphosate, which is the number one herbicide used worldwide, but it's really sits among a whole cadre of incredible toxins that are now sprayed on our, our soil systems. So 2,4-D is now used very broadly through the United States and other growing systems. 2,4-D is Agent Orange. Uh, it's just the racemic or the mirror image of the molecule, but um, Agent Orange was obviously just used to destroy the jungles of Cambodia and Vietnam over the course of the Vietnam War. And so for a 25 year period, we turned one of the most verdant jungles in the world into a literal moonscape, gray dust, a foot or two deep, wiped out every single tree, plant, vine, tree frog, insect, like just turn it into a moonscape with this chemical agent orange. And now we're treating all of the soil systems of the world with 2,4-D and glyphosate. Glyphosate's in the same organophosphate family as, as agent orange as well. So uh, 1973, Vietnam right wraps up by 1974, they're repurposing organophosphates into food and initial patents on, on Roundup are put in in 1974. By 1976, Roundup is in large scale use across the United States and other markets because it was so effective at killing anything green. And so it was used as a very effective herbicide, but you couldn't get the concentration very high because it would kill your corn, soybean and everything else because it kills anything green until 1992, 93 starts to roll around and they start to be able to genetically modify the plants to be able to tolerate glyphosate. And so they started GMO, you know, Roundup Ready crops with squash, I think 1993, corn, soybeans, 1996. And now we've got over 30 crops that are genetically modified to be able to handle direct spraying of Roundup, uh, which is, you know, the active ingredient of glyphosate. And so this has been this march towards you know, convenience at the farmer level to be able to manage 10,000 acres with two people, which is actually normal. Like it's normal to find one or two farmers managing thousands of acres. Those farmers have never put a shovel in their land because there's not time to go walk on their land or put a shovel in to check on their microbiology or check how many earthworms are left. So there's driving tractors around all the time, plowing, disking, you know, uh, spraying, whatever is needed. And so they're back and forth across this land on in heavy equipment all the time. And they're largely unaware of just the devastation of microbial and nutrient density within their own soils. And it always surprises them when you go out in the field and dig a, you know, 12 by 12 by 12 inch hole and find out that there's zero earthworms. It only takes a single spraying of glyphosate in a field so to wipe out 100% of the top dwelling earthworms and 50% of the entire deep dwelling population. You do that now two or three times a year for 30 years, you've annihilated your earthworms. In that process, you also wiped out all the little microbes, the bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes. This is the life that makes soil happen. Soil that's happening, meaning lots of microbial diversity that's then feeding a mycelial network of, of the fungi that's then creating this incredible relationship to plant roots in which uh, something called the, the mycorrhizae are produced. And the mycorrhizae is kind of that spider webby looking stuff that you see in a pot if you pull, you know, if you repot a plant at home or something like that. Those little spider webs uh, are these little tubules that are produced by in, in uh, cooperation between the mycelium and the root systems of a plant. And so they, they're now transiting all of this information and nutrients from the soil up into the plant. With herbicide chronic usage, you lose the, the bacteria that would food, feed the fungi, you lose the fungi, the mycelial network, you lose the mycorrhizae, and now you've got plants that are growing with a very difficult time extracting nutrients. So to overcome that, the farmer has to put in more and more chemical inputs to try to overcome this barrier of, of bioavailability of nutrients. And so they're spraying more and more nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium to try to force these these macronutrients into the plants but what they're not doing is replacing all the micronutrients and so you might have a green corn plant but you have no manganese in there you have no selenium you have none of the trace nutrients that are necessary for biology to happen on the other side of the consumption of that plant 
And so we're going to this vast, you know, nutrient deficiency in both macro and micronutrients as we destroy the microbial systems of the soil and therefore start growing deficient plants. That's part of the issue. The second part of the issue that's leading to this obesity epidemic that I'm very frustrated at my industry in medicine that we have done such a poor job understanding the obesity epidemic. I, I'm appalled at my own education. Like I was not trained to understand why the world suddenly got obese. It, it's always blamed on sugar. Like, oh, we just, you know, eat too much sugar. We, sugar was our main caloric intake, you know, as far back as the 1920s. Like we, we have always loved sugar. We've always, it's, you know, the sugar industry was massive in the late 1800s. We had slave labor being moved out of India to, to fuel the, the British and, and Dutch you know, sugar cane fields in South Africa. That's 150 years ago. So sugar has been a problem forever. We didn't develop this obesity epidemic until suddenly in the early 80s. And what happened in those few years is that those herbicides started going up in concentration within our food and water systems. And the most sensitive microbes to these herbicides that function as antibiotics. I didn't maybe mention that glyphosate kills weeds, but it kills the bacteria and fungi in the soil systems directly. And so it functions as this potent antibiotic, but the most sensitive bacteria in the body that would respond to these low levels of antibiotics are actually the mitochondria. These are small little bacteria that live inside of our cells and produce the energy uh, from our food that make it available to the energy available to us. Each human cell has about 200 mitochondria. As you start to poison those mitochondria, the, the reservoir of, of life within the cell goes down. And so you, you accelerate the, the deterioration of the microbial reservoir uh, with the mitochondrial reservoir within the human body as you start adding glyphosate to food and water systems. If the bacteria in your gut are feeding your body, those nutrients, you know, glucose and, and carbohydrates, as well as fatty acids. Those are your two fuel sources. Protein is not a fuel. Uh, so your, your sugar and fats are being channeled into your gut, lining into the liver, repackaged, sent out to the body. But if the body, body is receiving all of that caloric opportunity with sugars and fats, but don't have enough mitochondria to process that down, it simply, each cell stops taking up the, the nutrients or those potential calories or sending it right back after failing to convert. And, then, and you start storing all of those calories in the liver. And so you start getting fatty liver. And so by the 1980s, we were seeing this explosion of fatty liver from nutritional sources because the mitochondrial pro productivity was declining. We basically had a bottleneck of caloric you know, demand or caloric opportunities, caloric reservoir backing up into the liver. Once the liver is full of fat, you start to develop diabetes. So you get insulin resistance. So by the late eighties, we certainly suddenly see this explosion of prediabetes and diabetes in children and adults and everything else. And so obesity then leads to, you know, that, that phenomenon of diabetes and insulin resistance, which then accelerates cardiovascular disease, cancers, uh, immune dysfunction, you know, go on down the list. But it, so it was really the destruction of microbes at the soil level. With that, we saw the advent of the destruction of uh, mitochondria inside of our cells. And so soil, gut microbiome collapse, and then mitochondrial collapse inside the cells. Those are kind of your three layers of impact of, of glyphosate and other you know, herbicide pesticide residues within our food system. Wow, that was brilliantly explained. And I'm wondering, do you have an opinion on Ozempic? It's gotten pretty popular lately. And I'm, is this going to be the thing that gets us out of jail? <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, you know, drugifying the complex endocrine system of the human that regulates appetite is basically saying, we're going to make it easier for you to run on an empty tank. It's basically what, what these drugs are doing. And so they're taking away the neurologic stimuli for food intake uh, through a bunch of different mechanisms. It's the opposite of, you know, THC and CBD that drives you to eat more, right? And so there's, there's plant compounds that accelerate your food intake by regulating or, or manipulating appetite. And there's you know, drugs that will reduce that there's, and then there's this whole impetus for breaking the, the, the push of nutrients through the liver. And, you know, it's, it's, it's such a reductionist, you know, kind of short sighted approach to, to human health. Like if we just take nutrients away from the body, then they will be less obese. Uh, it, it's, it's a self-defeating premise and it's amazing that we turn these into multi-billion dollar drugs and, neither the doctor or the patient are asking the right questions in these scenarios. And I mean, from my opinion at this point, you know, it's, 
it's one of the deepest you know ethical dilemmas that the industry has now is doctors are no longer trained to be healers doctors are trained to be pharmaceutical technicians and we are brainwashed out of asking these root cause questions or these you know taking a look at the forest we're just not encouraged to do it at all uh, in fact we're you know disincentivized you know we're threatened you know, you know you're not doing standard of care then then your license is going to be taken away or whatnot and so the standard of care is these following drugs and if you're not prescribing a statin and a blood pressure medicine and you know one of these you know obesity drugs to your patients you're not following standard of care and so you can be subject to to legal consequences you could be sued by your patients you could be sued by industry you could be sued by you know and so it's these vague you know veiled threats of non-compliance with the pharmaceutical standard of care that has us disincentivized from even popping our head above the earth to take a look around and see see what we've created here together and 